Welcome everyone. My name is Mario Bella. I'm a, a director in the Redefining Value team at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Over to you, Stephanie. Thanks very much, Mario. I appreciate that. So um, I am really excited to share with you the um, position statement database. Um, for those of you on the call that don't know much about the embedding project, um, we are a public benefit research project. We are housed um, uh, within a, a number of different universities, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, BC, um, the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town. Uh, we have colleagues that we work with at the Judge School at Cambridge um, and other institutions worldwide. And together, um, we collaborate with a number of leading companies around the world to help them to embed sustainability across their operations and decision making. And through doing that research and that work, then we are able to develop a set of tools um, to help support this transition um, to what we, we um, are now starting to call a shift to systems value. So um, I think that's where I'd like to begin is just reinforcing this idea of, of moving from what has been called shareholder value through stakeholder value and into systems value. And there may be a few of you that are on the call that joined us for our goals um, session as well. So we'll try not to repeat too much as we go along, but I think these pieces are pretty foundational to understanding what it is that we're looking for within the database. And so when we think about an embedded strategy, it's really one that acknowledges this need to operate within a set of socio-ecological thresholds. Considering longer time frame, though, you know, for more than 50 years, um, we have seen this movement of shareholder value really um, coming to a place of primacy in terms of decision making within companies. And, you know, frankly, it really hasn't always been that way. Um, but it certainly um, really took hold, you know, in the 80s and 90s and, and the early part of 2000s. And so now we're seeing a shift in thinking about um, stakeholder value and and it comes in many forms so um, some talk about it in terms of the triple bottom line other talks about others talk about it in terms of shared value and while this um, it takes us part of the way in terms of thinking that companies need to consider social environmental and economic factors and that they need to um, engage in conversations with with a variety of different stakeholders uh, one of the issues that we find is that that area um, where those overlap become quite small and you end up with just a series of initiatives um, in organizations. So what we're now um, trying to help companies think about is their role in delivering on systems value, where a company acknowledges that its own resilience is dependent on the resilience of the social systems where it operates and the resilience of the one planet that we all share. And so for those that are interested in thinking about this or that are moving along this journey, um, we have provided um, a, a guide on embedded strategies for the sustainability transition. And, and it outlines a process that helps you to develop both an embedded strategy and um, credible supporting goals to ensure that your company is doing its part to maintain the resilience of key environmental and social systems. And it begins with a really thorough exercise in scanning. Um, so we have developed a different tool that, that helps companies to really think about all the different issues, um, environmental, social governance um, issues that could have an impact and, and where the company could have an impact upon the communities and, and ecosystems where it operates. Um, some, uh, some guidance on how to further understand what your own direct and indirect impacts are and, and your ability to influence. And then to start to think about how you would prioritize among those. Today though, we're going to talk about um, acknowledging. So um, creating credible public positions on key issues in order to help um, your stakeholders, your, but your employees, your management, um, and, and really the world understand what the role is that you envision taking in, in this issue. And then the final piece is around setting goals and strategy, which um, we covered last 
time and that session is available online and we will um, give you a link to that at the end of the session. So as I mentioned today, we're thinking about this step called, that we call acknowledge and articulating a credible public position. So in order to understand that though, I think it is um, just quickly to think about what do we mean when we talk about um, thresholds because that's gonna come up in, a, in the database a lot in our discussions. So um, the first thing is to really think about what is the system? So if we take um, climate change as an issue as an example, um, we have seen laid out for us through the work of the um, International um, Panel on Climate Change that we, we know that there, we are on a current you know, business as usual trajectory um, and that that trajectory is shifting based on some actions and an and increase in availability of renewables. And so it's important to understand that um, your understanding of your systems trends are not static. And so, um, for instance, this year, with respect to many, many social issues, um, we've had to really adjust what we see as, as the current trajectory. Um, the next thing to start to think about is what is the threshold at which that system starts to become threatened? So what is the capacity of an ecosystem to absorb change? How much change can it absorb before it fundamentally is shifted and, and cannot exist um, in, in, a, you know, in its similar form anymore? Um, you know, where is the critical threshold in terms of species loss? Um, where is the critical threshold in terms of um, loss of water? Where is a critical threshold in communities in terms of reaching a level of inequality that um, really starts to shake the fundamentals? And so then what do we need to do differently? What is the necessary trajectory that would, that would ensure that we live within those thresholds, that we maintain the resilience of those underlying systems? So there are many ways that we can think about this and many tools that have been developed that help to inform this understanding. So one that many of you will be familiar with is the notion of planetary boundaries. Um, and that through this compilation of scientific studies, we see that um, we are reaching very critical levels of biodiversity loss of um, nitrogen um, uh, pollution in systems, and then also of course, um, climate change. Um, we also uh, have uh, things like the, the social donut that help us understand that not only is it important not to exceed these environmental ceilings or these um, planetary boundaries, but to also make sure that we maintain and enhance key societal foundations. So whether that's um, individual and community access to water, access to income, education, um, gender equality, um, access to energy, or the ability to work with dignity. Um, all of these things are critically important. And so one lens on this, although not a comprehensive uh, lens on every issue, um, is, the, is the sustainable development goals. And so while these goals were developed and, and agreed to by countries around the world, um, they were developed initially for us as a, as a global community. Um, now there is a lot of pressure and interest um, uh, from companies in starting to think about the role that each company may play in trying to help deliver on these goals. And so that's another way to think about what those experiments are and, and how I might conceptualize some of those um, key thresholds. So I wanted to just um, talk a little bit about um, the qualities of a well-articulated position statement. So all of these um, are outlined in a guidebook that's available on, um, on our website. Um, and in it, we have um, uh, outlined a, a, a one-pager that sort of breaks down what are some of the key things. So as you are writing your own position statement, you can use this as a bit of a checklist to see, are you covering these topics within your statement? And so really the background on this research is that we have viewed um, uh, literally almost um, you know, 10,000 position statements at this point from a range of industries, from a range of companies on a range of topics. And our original report was based on um, our initial set of about 3,000 of those. And uh, 
those really were highly variable. And, and maybe quickly, the, the bag story on this is that um, I had been doing interviews with um, CEOs and with global directors around the world. And I was talking to them about what had shifted their thinking um, with respect to position statement or with respect to um, environmental and social issues. How had they come to the point where they started to think about the need to embed the core business strategy within um, an understanding of the limits of social systems and, and um, ecosystems. And what came up um, very frequently was this idea that they were um, put uh, in the position of needing to articulate a position on behalf of the organization and that they were working with, whether it was um, the general counsel or the, the chief sustainability officer um, or both to try and come up with, um, with a public statement. And so that, you know, management would work on that, but the board really needed to be engaged in um, feeling comfortable with the statement that was going to go forth. And so um, what they mentioned is um, the lack of clarity in understanding what constituted a good statement. And um, there's so, there was such a variety, you know, some statements were two pages long, some statements were 25 pages long, um, some were really, really general, some were deeply, deeply specific. Um, and, you know, some looked more like a version of a sustainability report and others looked like versions of a manifesto, right? And and so we started to ask ourselves, well, what does a good statement look like? And so by looking across and analyzing each statement and asking ourselves, what are they trying to do at this point? What message with this, with this checklist? So the first thing is um, this idea of explaining the issue. So explaining your understanding of the issue and outlining how key trends um, might shape that issue in the future. And the second is really understanding then your relevant um, ecological or social limit or threshold beyond which you think that the resiliency of the system might be threatened. And the key here, and you'll see a theme in all of these, is being as transparent as possible with respect to your assumptions and your methods and the rationale that you're using for selecting them. And the reason that we're going to emphasize transparency through all of this is because um, this is a learning process for everyone. All of our, all of our collective understanding about how, to, how businesses should be living within key social and environmental systems is evolving. And we think it's really useful um, both for the company itself to really reflect on its own understanding and whether those conditions are changing over time but also to help others in your industry and others within your value chain um, and for your stakeholders to really understand and interrogate whether they agree with you, whether they think that there's ideas missing, whether um, there's additional information that they could add to your understanding. So to really make this a very active conversation as we all kind of evolve in our understanding on these things. And so then the last piece around explaining the issue is that as a result of your understanding of these limits, what collective action needs to be undertaken? And, and this isn't yet the action that you need to take, but just what is the work that needs to be done in order to shift that trajectory that brings it back in alignment? So um, I'm gonna pause there for a moment and just see um, if there are any questions or if anyone wants to dig into these. In each of these cases, we're gonna provide specific examples from um, different position statements that we've analyzed and, and give you a sense of, of, of what it looks like um, to start to, to do each of these things. Um, but I'm just looking in the chat box and I don't see any questions quite yet, so I'm going to keep going. But please don't hesitate to stop me at any time or to um, um, put any questions in the chat. Okay, so the next piece then is linking the issue to your strategy. So the idea here is that um, we really want um, to see how companies are linking these issues to their core strategies. And it's the difference here between it becoming an embedded part of your strategy and um, in contrast, having it be philanthropy, right? 
So it's not that um, companies cannot engage in philanthropic efforts, but with respect to these core issues, we really want to see companies start to link how both it could have impact on their own business, including the relevant risks and opportunities, because that really helps your reader understand that um, your, your taking action on this is um, not something that's going to be discretionary, right? This is not something that um, is a pet project of a particular executive team, but instead is something that you recognize is fundamentally linked to how your business operates. And so the next piece is to discuss then your company's understanding of its relevant operational and value chain impacts. So what are the, the um, direct operational impacts that result from your op from your um, your business operations, and where do these impacts reside within your value chain? Whether that's in um, your supplier network, um, in in the goods that you procure, or it's in the customer's use of your products, or potentially it's in um, the use of your financing. So um, the the initiatives um, that you end up um, providing um, capital to. So I'm just seeing in the chat here, Marcus asks, understand that it's, understand that it's easier to understand and perhaps set ecological limits. How do you go about setting social limits? So let me pause there and, and think about, in fact, um, yeah, I, I, we'll come to that a little bit. Let, let me talk about that a little bit right now and then just reassure that when we come to this idea of setting thresholds, um, we'll address these social limits in a little bit more detail for sure. Um, I think the issue with social limits is um, uh, that it, this, this conversation that I talked about of engaging with a broad set of um, knowledge holders around the social systems in which you operate becomes even more important. Um, because um, when you think about the individual operating context that you, that you um, are in, there's a huge amount of variability in terms of these underlying um, social issues and, and the resilience. And so one of the things that we've created that may be useful for this, um, Mark, is uh, we have another guide that will be coming out shortly that helps companies think about um, how communities are establishing their own resilience and, and how they're thinking about and assessing their own resilience. And... Um, and so this becomes um, a, an ongoing and dynamic conversation with uh, people who have on the ground knowledge in the communities where you operate um, for them to be able to help you as a company think about where their key vulnerabilities may lie and also what the potential role might be for your company in helping to support them or how potentially your company may be inadvertently eroding that resilience. And so, you know, just as a really concrete example of that, um, what we've experienced with respect to the pandemic um, has exemplified that in many communities. So we've seen that companies, their own need for personal protective equipment, for instance, has really competed with the supply available for um, local doctors, uh, local hospitals. So, you know, on the news this morning, um, I was hearing that, um, uh, local family doctors in British Columbia are, are still really struggling to get personal protective equipment because, um, and, you know, they're having, to, they're having to compete with others in order to source it. So this really sort of dynamic understanding of through your own actions, are you contributing to or potentially eroding the resilience of the communities in which you operate? So, um, I might, and we'll come back to those social thresholds for sure, but maybe I'll just um, talk about this, this last little bit. And it's around um, clarifying your commitments. And so really, um, if you already have commitments in place, this is about articulating a pattern of past decision-making um, that, that you are not just um, coming to this issue fresh, but in fact, you have been already engaging. And so whether this is, articulating a pattern of, of past carbon reduction or articulating a pattern of investments that you've made in um, building, um, uh, you know, in, in contributing to, to um, job 
creation or um, uh, contributing to um, education or, or language preservation or whatever it is that, uh, that you're doing with respect to those different issues, um, or building capacity in your supply chain um, around their understanding of, of biodiversity or supporting others who are doing that work. Um, and then it's also really about clarifying your commitment to operate within relevant limits. And so this is where um, that you that you understand above you you said you understand the limits and here it's where you clearly say that we know that we need to live within them that we have to do our part and then to clarify um that you are committed to addressing the impacts that are within your direct operations the impacts that are within your value chain and um to exert your influence to drive broader systems change. And this last one, let me just break that down in terms of what we mean about that. So it, it could very well be that you don't have um, a lot of um, uh, direct impacts or, you know, or that most of those impacts potentially reside within your value chain, but you may have... Um, be uniquely positioned because of the reputation that you have, because of a set of resources and skills that you hold, um, because of your um, uh, ability to set the terms of, of engagement, however that may be, um, that you might be able to play a really crucial role in changing that system. So one of the um, you know, one of the examples that we talk about, we have a we have a guide again on our on our website where we talk about community partnerships for resilience. And one of the examples there is as uh, from Woolworths, which is um, uh, a retailer um, headquartered in South Africa, where um, they learned through their relationship with Marks and Spencer that um, that a number of the products that they were sourcing through their supply chain that they had long-standing sourcing arrangements with. Uh, were considered very, very high water risk by Marks and Spencer. And um, when you look at that region in the, in the Brede Valley, um, those suppliers are ones that, Mar that Woolworths had been working with from, from a long time um, to actually help them reduce their water consumption. And so those farms actually were 10 to 15 times more water efficient than, than many of the other farms in the country. Um, so then when they panned back, they asked themselves, well, this is, this is a broader systems issue. And so what they realized is that they were uniquely positioned to have to convene a conversation between farmers, between the neighboring communities, um, between some government actors. And so what they did is they, they acted to convene initially and to fund a process but then they stepped back and allowed the participants within that watershed to define their own plan forward. And so that's the a kind of example of what we mean around companies um, choosing to exert their influence in order to drive broader um, positive systems change. And there, there are lots of different examples that we could point to. So the final thing is that in the position statement, um, after asking you for all of these different things, we also encourage you to keep it short and accessible. Um, and also to make sure that your document is publicly accessible and it's easy to find, um, that you avoid reporting on short-term performance or discussing your awards and accolades. Those are the kinds of things that still go in your sustainability report or your integrated report. And to um, sometimes it's a useful thing to provide some background on addressing what motivated the statement or the process that led to its development. And the last piece is really about being clear on sign off and the accountability for who's going to be responsible for this. So I'm going to, um, Oh, someone is happy to donate PPE and that is um, fantastic. So we will follow up with that person afterwards. Um, so, um, yeah, so what I'd like to do now actually is to start to show you the database. And I would encourage you, so I'm just going to leave this slide up before I, I do. I would encourage you on the line, please um, take a look at it while we're, while we're going through this. So go ahead and go to eproj.org forward slash positions. And I'll just give you a moment to do that.
And then I'm going to um, take you there myself. So hopefully you are seeing um, the database. Or, and so here it is. There's a little video here um, that shows you how to use it. But essentially what we've done is we've organized it. I, I mentioned as part of this process, this idea of scanning. And so we went through a, a multi-year process of evaluating sustainability reports and you know, all the different frameworks, the SDG, the Future Fit Business Benchmark, the Planetary Boundaries, Societal Foundations, um, 13 different community resilience frameworks and identified and categorized all these different issues and sub-issues. And then, so we've grouped them this way. And so then you can um, click on an issue. So we were just talking about water or um, maybe we were talking about rights and resilience in communities or because we were just talking about PPE, for instance, um, that you um, uh, can start to think about how you would um, sort. So if we're thinking about well-being at work because we were talking about um, personal protective equipment, then what we can do is click on that and then we can um, get a sense of what companies we have in there with respect that have positions. Um, we can sort by sector. If we wanted to see a particular company, I can go in and I can just say, um, I'm really interested in seeing Apple's statement. So there I can see Apple's statement, or perhaps um, I'm interested in seeing all statements that are in the financial sector. Um, so there are all the statements that are in the financial sector. And what we're doing is we're actually going to start keeping um, the older statements in the database. Um, and so you can tell us whether you want to know, um, you want to only see current statements, um, that's fine. Um, and then we also have a series of topics that we see trending. And so for instance, if you were really interested, we just talked about PPE, if you're really interested in seeing what statements relate to, sorry, I probably have that too narrow. Let me stick that back to all. Um, what statements relate to COVID-19 and pandemics? These are the companies that have produced a statement on those issues. So once we find a statement that we wanna take a look at, um, the, the, how um, those, Categories that I talked about, explaining the issue, linking it to the strategy, clarifying the commitments, and um, being clear on oversight. Um, those, depending on how dark the blue is, um, that's how well they meet um, the criteria that we've outlined. And so I can click on a particular statement. So if we were to take um, Microsoft statement as an example here, then um, we have all those little um, subtopics. Um, and then if I click on it, it will take us to um, the actual statement. Um, so I'm gonna go back because that one is um, looking a little funny. So let me just grab a different statement here. Um, and so normally what you'll find is it's like this. I'm, I'm not sure what was going on with that one. Um, and, and then in it, you'll see that we've actually indicated the information that we are using to make our assessment. So I think this is useful for two reasons. One is we want to be really transparent about the information that we're using to make our assessment. And that gives you as a company an opportunity to provide us with feedback if you think that um, we've missed something or that we're not being fair in our assessment. Um, but it also is helpful for those that are trying to author statements themselves to be directed to ideas um, and approaches that might be useful within their own context. So I think the, the thing maybe that's useful to do is I want to invite um, Brandon into the conversation. So Brandon works on our team. Um, he really has been the, um, the driving force beside, behind the position statement database. Um, and so he's a, a phenomenal resource on these topics. Um, Brandon, let's start you. I asked you to identify a few statements that you have um, that have come out um, and, it, and it you've been impressed with. And so let's start with the CLP statement. Um, what is it that you um, really thought uh, was a strength in this statement? Sure, yeah. So with China Light and Power, uh, one of the first things that stood out is 
this is a, a, a new statement that came out uh, midway through last year. And this statement really highlights CLP Group's uh, maturation on the topic of climate change. This was their first position they'd made on the topic. Uh, and one of the things that I thought they did really well was they transparently explained from the, the very beginning what they understand about climate change and what they don't uh, and what they're ready to commit to. So they acknowledge right in the beginning that they're not yet ready to set a science-based target, but they do acknowledge the work that's been done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they explain why it's necessary for them to uh, set targets that are in alignment with those limits. Uh, one of the things that this document does that so others uh, often forget to or just don't do is there's also a clear-cut endorsement from the CEO, uh, Richard Lancaster, yeah. uh, as well as a personal message. And it, it's often unclear when I'm evaluating statements, the level of, uh, uh, like, where responsibility is allocated to and, uh, and whether or not the statement even has board or executive approval. So in those cases, it's difficult to tell who's accountable and uh, as well as what your as the audience, what your expectation should be in terms of, of uh, um, details being provided later on about meeting the, the, the commitments they've set. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if, you know, if people take nothing <laughs> away from this, it's that, it's, um, it's that, you know, there are a lot of statements out there, um, but few of those statements really go the next step of actually explaining what accountability the organization is taking on. And I think that is something that really differentiates um, um, one statement from another. Uh, so there are two things in particular that this statement from Levi's does well. Uh, one is they employ a contextualized water stress approach to, to limits or thresholds. Uh, and the other thing they do especially well is they explain why collective action is necessary. They explain what it looks like and how it can be a part of it. I often find that with water related statements, the, the vast majority of them, the, the focus is on just reducing water, but they don't explain uh, why they've set the targets they do or whether or not the reductions would even be meaningful. For Levi's, they state very clearly from the outset that saving a liter of water where water is plentiful uh, is not as critical as saving a liter of water where water is scarce. Uh, so they really focus on that catchment uh, level aspect of, of thresholds. Uh, and the second aspect uh, in regards to the collection ac uh, collective action, they, they acknowledge that when it comes to making a difference at scale, uh, their success as a company comes from uh, uh, determining effective limits and making sure that they are able to build partnerships and coalitions where other organizations, other industry members are able to use work that they've already done themselves and apply it to, uh, to their own organizations and allow for that greater systems level influence to, uh, uh, to grow. Yeah, that's, that's helpful, I think. And, and so that's why at the beginning, we really wanted to emphasize this idea of, of what is a contextual goal and why does it matter to, to set your goals in terms of context, because um, that, that understanding really is what helps to shape where it makes the most sense to prioritize your efforts and where you can have the highest social and environmental return for, for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, Kellogg, you liked their climate policy statement. Why? Uh, so this statement from Kellogg's is actually, it was first written in 2015 and it was one of the first statements where it really stood out as uh, meeting the criteria that we uh, first set out in our rubric. Uh, this position explains well the issue uh, of climate change. They, uh, Kellogg's explains well their understanding of atmospheric science. And this isn't absolutely necessary, but it does help establish the credibility of their knowledge early on. And it helps establish credibility around their commitments uh, because it's very clear that the goals that they're setting, they've set them based on uh, the, the, the methodology that's been set out around a two degree or 
uh, 1.5 degree limit. Uh, they also explain how climate change has already impacted them, how it's going to be impacting them uh, uh, in the near future, and what long-term impacts from climate change could look like for them. Uh, they talk about how commodity prices have been shocked. They explain about volatile weather. And so when they make their commitments, uh, they know that they need to address scopes one, two, and three. It's not just about what their own uh, operations are doing. Uh, it's also about how their value chain uh, and uh, customer use of their products is, is making an impact on the issue of climate change. Uh, and one last thing that I like about the statement from Kellogg's is they they discuss their pattern of action historically, and it helps to create this longer term narrative of work they've already done on this issue and how that has informed the work that they plan to do in the future. That's great. And I mean, we're, we're going to keep going and, and you're going to benefit from this, but I, I just, um, you know, as I listen to you, Brandon, and I, I'm always incredibly impressed and grateful that you are, that you are on our team, because as you can see, Brandon is so incredibly thoughtful. Um, you know, just know that when you are issuing a statement that there is this person in the world that is going to engage very, very deeply with it and think very, very carefully, you know, about what you're doing. And so I know a number of our um, embedding project um, companies and certainly the WBCSD members as well and, and other companies that are on the line. If you, you know, if you want to have a conversation, um, Brandon is uh, an absolute um, um, mine of information on these things. And, and so hopefully that's um, helpful to you as well. Um, okay, so, um, we just really wanted to um, break this down again and just, just say that um, companies really are under pressure to articulate a credible position on important ESG issues. And, and that this credibility, we believe, as you heard from what Brandon has just articulated about the statements that he sees as some of the strongest right now, um, it stems from really addressing your company's understanding of the context in which it operates and also in its ability to clarify its role and commitments to address these challenges. Um, and so, you know, we'll say it one more time that that, that that means explaining the issue, linking it clearly to your strategy, clarifying your commitments in terms of what you are going to do, and not just setting out commitments for others. So especially when we start to talk about the, the um, piece around value chain, is it's not just saying, our value chain is going to reduce its water consumption by 60%, um, but instead saying we are going to engage in the following actions in order to support our um, value chain in reducing its consumption. So really thinking about what is your commitment and your actions and being really credible about that and then just being very clear on the sign off. So we're going to go through just one by one and, and break each of these down. And then as we go along, um, we really would like to, um, to tap into the knowledge. So um, if, if it's possible, maybe um, I'll just pause here because one of the statements that we also, that if you look in the database, there are a couple of companies that have uh, quite a few very strong statements. And uh, one of the companies that has quite a few very strong statements is Danone. Um, and so we're lucky because uh, we have Jeanette Coombs on the line. Um, I hope we're, I, I saw her earlier. I hope she's still there. Um, and so so Jeanette, as you hear this and you, and you reflect on what you're seeing, can you tell us a little bit about Danone's journey in creating statements? Because um, you know, a lot of what we're saying are things that Danone does very well in its statements. You're going as we go through, you're gonna see Danone comes up a lot here as an exemplar. No, that's great to hear, and and thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, and thank you both. This is a this is a really uh, we think uh, incredibly useful project, and uh, because the first thing I want to mention is that um, I'm well, my role is uh, is to lead global advocacy and engagement for sustainability agenda, which we call One Fund Agenda. So I've been involved with quite a few um, policy and position statements. Uh, and I think uh, what you're doing is absolutely key because one of the things that we always do is we have a benchmark. So we really understand what other companies are doing, what our competitors are doing, what leaders and other sectors are doing. And that's absolutely uh, critical to the process that we have. 
And um, one thing I want to point out about the process is that uh, it's never it's never straightforward or easy because I think what's really key to a successful policy is really deep consultation in both internally and externally. So we mm-hmm. always um, take the time, and it does take time, to, uh, I work on the public affairs side, I always work with uh, our experts, internal experts on climate, on agriculture, on water, um, and we always take the time to consult with a large a number of stakeholders internally and externally. And often, in fact, what we've done is we've, we've linked a policy or a position with something else, a broader stakeholder initiative. So to give you a very specific example, um, I worked a lot on our packaging policy that we came out with in 2018. And that um, we were, were, were very involved in uh, as members of the New Plastics Economy Initiative with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And at the same time, they were developing this global commitment on plastics. And so what we really did very consciously is link our policy with the global commitment, which we found to be a very, very powerful framework. So that really helped in not only killing two birds with one stone, because anyway, we were going to join the global commitment and have to report on progress, but also we found it to be quite a powerful framework. So it helped shape our and structure our policy. And with the climate policy that we have, um, that was pretty, we, we, we came out with that in 2015. I would say that um, even even if we did them in the beginning, we were always looking, okay, well, we knew the science-based targets initiative was was going to be coming. We consulted a lot with stakeholders like WWF um, and and we ended up, uh, let's say, strengthening the climate policy by uh, by validating our science-based targets for for GHG emissions reduction. So we really always look to link when we can with a broader uh, stakeholder initiative, multi-stakeholder initiative. So that's the voice point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make, and it's really obvious, but, um, but the way we, we always go about doing this is we do a lot of consultation. We really try to understand what the reality of the business is, what the societal expectations are, where the tensions are, and we try to make them healthy tensions. And so really come up with what we feel uh, are is the sweet spot between societal expectations and then what the company ambition and reality is. And that is really helps us to establish our vision and ambition. And then we always have at the next level, you know, what are the kind of key commitment areas and what are our commitments with KPIs, of course. And, uh, and so obviously the more specific you can get, the more specific you can get on your KPIs, the more credible it is. And then when you port on your progress, that's when it becomes really, uh, we feel uh, credible. And, and the last point I wanted to make, and because you mentioned this earlier about embedding it in the business, we spend a lot of time uh, after uh, not only consulting internal stakeholders to develop the policy, but after the policy comes out, we spend a lot of time and resources in educating people internally. Because what yeah. we found that these policies do is really set a framework for, for our brands to act, for our big country business units to act. And we see this very clearly, for example, we set the, in our climate policy, we set an ambition to be zero by 2050. This was in 20, 2015. And so that really helped our brands in terms of setting their ambition. And so we had a number of brands since, like Evian at the uh, global level, like Volvic at the global level, um, that have become carbon neutral. Same with our, with our packaging policy. We really set a framework that allowed our brands to understand how they could act and so we've had, you know, a lot of brands come out with, we set out a, a very high ambition saying that we wanted to come out with 100% um, recycled plastic uh, uh, packaging in, in all of our in regions where we operate. And so that really helped push our brands to do that. And so I think that's, um, that's really important in embedding it in the business and really thinking about it when you craft the policy as a framework for your brands and for your business units to act and spend a lot of time. We have webinars, we have uh, education series internally to educate people so that they can act. I love that point, Jeanette, because um, it's something that I heard from, from directors and, and a number of people used a similar phrase and then they called it permission to care. And, and this idea that by really um, setting up this clear expectation and, and it, gave, it gives the business operations the confidence to know that they can make plans around those goals, knowing that the expectation is clear, it's public, it's set. Um, and so it, it actually gives them um, the confidence to propose things that maybe have 
a, a little longer term return on investment um, that requires a bit more upfront um, or, or that to anticipate the constraints that that is going to create on the way that the business is going to have to grow and therefore to be able to include that as part of their decision making. So I, I really appreciate you raising that because that's certainly consistent with what we've heard from other companies as well. Yeah, that's exactly it. That it really helps establish clear priorities for the business. And we know when you, you always have in business these short term and longer term, the, the tension between them. And this really empowers our operations, especially since we have to report on progress and our brands um, to make the investments needed for longer term transformation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and so, Brandon, when you think about explaining the issue um, and ex specifically explaining your understanding of the issue, outlining key trends and how they may shape the future, what in particular are you looking for? Uh, so one thing that comes to mind right away uh, is I want to know the scope of the, the trends that they're discussing. So we have two examples here on the screen, Danone and uh, Diageo. Uh, for those who don't know, Diageo is a beverages company that makes uh, a wide range of different alcoholic beverages. In case we have Diageo on the line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Diageo. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so with these two statements that we have here on the screen, uh, for example, uh, in Danone's uh, statement, they explain uh, in the beginning that by 2025, within the next five years, uh, 50 countries uh, and approximately one third of the world's population is going to have regular water shortages, and especially so in, uh, in cities. And with uh, Diageo, uh, they recognize that water stress is significant and that currently uh, about 30% of people worldwide lack access to safe, readily available water at home, uh, and that this number of people is going to be growing steadily. Yeah, and so... Um... I, what I thought was interesting that, that Jeanette mentioned as well was this kind of link to other um, sources of expertise or, or developing understandings. <clears throat> so to what extent do you think it's useful to, um, to link your understanding of the trends to broader efforts to actually understand those? It's very important. And it also, it, it's something that varies a lot by issue. Uh, there was that question earlier about uh, connecting to to the social thresholds. And I think this is an area where companies can establish uh, their understanding early on and also recognize work that's already been done on it. So if we're talking about climate change, you'll often see companies referencing the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. You'll see references to uh, the greenhouse gas protocols and other works like that. So it really helps to speak to not only the understanding that your company has on the issue, but also to other organizations that have worked on it and who themselves have helped to determine uh, how these trends and trajectories are uh, progressing and the work that needs to be done uh, at a broad level. Fantastic. So the next one we have now is um, explaining your understanding of the relevant ecological or social limit. And um, so you've picked Danone as an example again here. Um, what is it that you like about what they're doing? So the re yeah, so I picked Danone here, and I picked them uh, specifically because they they encapsulate very nicely and concisely what a contextual thresholds based uh, uh, understanding of of the water issue is for them. So they say that it's a time bound target uh, that is at the catchment local catchment level, and that uh, when they're setting targets, whether they're quantitative or qualitative, this allows them to go and evaluate. Uh, their performance with what the uh, specific catchment is providing in terms of, of water over the course of a, uh, of a year and within the context of what the communities themselves are drawing from those catchments. So as with Levi's, this will allow Danone to set commitments that, uh, that recognize that, a water, uh, that, that water stress is the most important factor when determining how you're going to be going and, and setting targets about water reduction. It's about focusing on areas that don't have an abundance of, uh, uh, of water. Super. Um, the next one is um, understanding what collective action needs to happen. Right. So two companies here, uh, South 32 and Levi's. Uh, and with South 32, uh, they explain that uh, understanding local water usage and its impacts 
uh, working towards that is going to involve them having to work collaboratively and transparently uh, with all other parties that are going to be connected to that uh, to that local catchment. Um, and so what this ends up meaning is that uh, they need to go and take an approach that will allow them to speak with different communities, with different organizations, with different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, and rights holders in these different areas and make sure that the uh, commitments that they're making acknowledge the challenges that they themselves are facing. And then with Levi's, uh, collective action for them, Levi's statement uh, is somewhat groundbreaking simply because they acknowledge the work that's already been done and they really highlight the work that they've done and how they're going to share their understanding of, uh, uh, of water context. And through that uh, knowledge, help other members within their value chain and others within the, the local system uh, improve upon the goals that they have and, and, and their own efforts to, uh, uh, to use limited water. Great. So, um... So the next thing that we wanted to look at is how you go about linking this to your strategy. So what are you looking for when it comes to linking um, your position to the issue to the strategic impact? So an essential component here is how is your uh, understanding of this issue and your efforts towards this issue going to affect your strategy? So this will often boil down to what are the risks that, uh, say, climate change or water scarcity will have in your company? What are the opportunities that come from you addressing this issue uh, proactively? Uh, tech as a mining company, they, they absolutely depend upon having the, uh, uh, the, the, the support of the communities in which they're working, uh, particularly indigenous groups. And so when they're talking about uh, watersheds, they make it very clear that in order to make sure that, uh, that they have that license to operate and that societal acceptance, they need to have responsible water management and to make sure that there is uh, trust within those watersheds that they're, that they're depending upon and trust that they're going to be good stewards of water usage. Thanks, I think that's a great example. And so then um, to then discuss um, a company's understanding of it relevant operational value chain impacts and the way in which it could potentially influence the system? So I think this is one of, if not the most important parts of a position statement. And it's, it comes down to a company transparently explaining what their impacts on the issue are. It's really easy for a company to say how these various issues are going to negatively impact them. It's much more difficult for companies to explain how they themselves uh, have and actively are contributing to whatever those negative uh, impacts of, a, of an issue are. So Tech and Roche, one thing that I liked about these statements is Tech acknowledges right away, and they acknowledge this throughout their documents ac across the board, regardless of issue. They acknowledge that mining is an activity that, uh, f within the context of water, uses a lot of water, uh, and there are also risks from their operations that could affect the quality of water, whether it's uh, through discharges or... Uh, uh, you know, having just to simply maintain proper uh, 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 management of tailings. With Roche, uh, one of the only pharmaceutical companies that I've seen to do this, they acknowledge that there's very valid concerns that the public has about what happens when pharmaceuticals are released into waterways uh, and they address what those impacts could be and they transparently explain how they are currently and in the future going to be trying to reduce any sort of impact from that. Super. So the next one is um, clarifying your commitment. So um, you um, have talked a little bit about this, but what, what would you like to see when you're looking at how people articulate a pattern of past decision-making? Uh, so when a company is articulating a pattern of past decision-making, especially when the commitment they're making is a, uh, uh, rather when the statement itself is like a new position statement, it's really valuable to know what work the company is already building off of, whether it's the work done of others or work that they themselves have done, perhaps in piecemeal, perhaps as part of a organized uh, strategy. With Mars's statement, uh, the inclusion of these, uh, uh, of say the UN CEO's water mandate, 
uh, you know, participating in the Sea of Water Mandates Water Stewardship Collaboration. They, they helped to create a narrative showing that, you know, they've been doing this work for at least the last like four or five years. And it helps to build the reader's understanding of whether or not uh, Mars or a company like them is taking a mature approach where they've already determined, you know, the work that they've done, like, like how much of that work still needs to be done? Like what is their trajectory in terms of being able to make the sorts of commitments they need to, to account for their full responsibility on the issue. Uh, and also just being able to go and explain who it is that they may be currently partnered with. That also gives an idea through those partners of, of clarifying what uh, boundaries there may be or what requirements there may be on them. So if we're looking at companies that have made, say, climate pledges uh, in regards to the IPCC, you'll, you'll know that the commitments they make, they're going to have to be aligned with those two degree, 1.5 degree recommendations. So it just helps to further establish the, the parameters of the commitments that they're going to set. Fantastic. Um, so then it's about clarifying your commitment to actually operate within relevant thresholds and limits. So what does that look like in your mind? This is, this is my favorite one because this is where I often find statements start to get loose. Uh, so when you can <laughs> clarify commitment, so when you're clarifying from the under, uh, your understanding of the limit from the very beginning, uh, it gives the impression that your commitments will also be in line with it. And that's very often not the case. With Mars and Danone, both of them not only explain in the beginning what their understanding of water-related thresholds are, but they also clarify in their commitments that their commitments are going to be in alignment with that. So it's not just about them recognizing that thresholds and limits are, are important uh, and then just you know, making, uh, uh, setting commitments that themselves might not actually address that limit. It's instead about them saying, you know, Mars water stewardship goal is to ensure water use in our value chain is within annually renewable levels by watershed. So you know that the commitments that they're making are absolutely going to be in line with what their understanding of the limit is. Uh, same with Danone, they're making sure that how they have determined water threshold within that local catchment context, that is how their commitments are going to be informed. So it, it helps to ensure the reader that the commitments they've set are ones that the company themselves believe will uh, do the work that needs to be done in order to get the results that they believe are necessary. And so maybe it's a good thing to, to say um, right now when we talk about, so how are we assessing relevant limits? So, so um, do we have some magic list of what is an appropriate limit and what is not an appropriate limit? And do we judge organizations against that? Or what are we, what are, how are we assessing um, whether an organization is attempting to articulate a relevant limit? Uh, so it depends on what the on what the issue is, but with a lot of these issues, there are already socially determined uh, limits for. Uh, so, for example, we have the the one point five degree, soon to be one degree goal for climate change. That's a limit that uh, that experts have determined will help to best allow for the system to remain resilient uh, and to build resilience in the future. And that itself is based on understanding of the scientific thresholds. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, with the uh, in regards to say social limits, it comes down then to local communities and and their determination of what it is that's required for them to be resilient. So there there isn't necessarily a uh, specific rubric that that we have where we'll say you know yay or nay uh, you as a company have uh, you know met our determination of of limits. Instead, it comes down to the companies themselves identifying what they see as limits and thresholds and then just providing really clear, really transparent uh, explanations for why they are viewing that as a, uh, uh, as a limit or threshold. And a lot of times too, companies themselves will be uh, fantastic experts on an issue and they themselves might even be doing groundbreaking work that helps to inform where other uh, uh, scientists and leading experts start to do work to help better provide frameworks that are broadly applicable. Uh, with Levi's, like that's, that's one example there where uh, they have been able to lead a lot of work globally in terms of determining that local water catchment. 
and they explain very clearly how they've set those parameters. And it, it allows you to, to scrutinize it. it. It at least gives you the information you need to, uh, to be able to uh, critically examine their, their commitments. I think that's great. And I think you raised two really important important points there. One is that we have seen certainly in, in the companies that, that we work with through the embedding project that, um, you know, some of the, of the world's leading experts in, in issues are embedded within um, these large companies. And so there is a lot to be learned, but that knowledge set um, very frequently has, has kind of resided within the company. And so, so that's where um, by pushing companies to try and get them to, to, um, you know, be more forthcoming with that knowledge set and the assumptions that they're using. That's a really powerful way that companies actually can exert their influence. So by writing a really clear, well-written position statement, um, that can have a really big impact on the conversation. So if we think about the release of um, Microsoft's latest climate goal and, and, you know, and this idea of accounting for historical emissions, Immediately, there was a skepticism, you know, people, people want to know more information, but, but Microsoft had really planned for that. And they had that video available, and they had more supporting information available, and they really kind of unpacked their understanding. And the result of that has been that other companies are able to take that as a model to think about how they might apply it to their own operations. And so that, through creating strong goals and through creating um, a strong supporting position on it, actually um, can exert a whole bunch of influence. And that um, I think is, is a really important piece of this and why we're so, we're so interested not only in that you state the limit, but that you also really um, help us understand how you've come to, um, come to that understanding and, and what factors shape that understanding um, so that you acknowledge that that understanding is going to evolve over time. Um, so when you're looking for um, addressing impacts within your direct operations, what kinds of things are you looking for? So when it comes to direct operations, uh, the main things that I'm looking for there are very clear cut explanations of what their operations involve and whether or not their operations themselves actually have a substantive impact on the issue. Uh, oftentimes you'll see companies who will go and say that they want to make a, you know, a 90% reduction, say, in, uh, in water usage or in uh, emissions, but it won't be clear if that's actually a meaningful goal if they haven't stated what their recognition of the limits and thresholds are, or if they haven't really explained what their actual impacts on the issue uh, themselves are. So with Danone, what I liked about this statement is they, they say, you know, 100% of the 55 watersheds, so 55 right away that they're operating in, uh, in highly water stress areas will involve uh, preservation or restoration plans. So out of all of the watersheds that they're operating in in the world, they've clearly identified that all the ones that they themselves have direct uh, uh, access to and draw from, every single one of those high risk water uh, areas is going to have proper planning. So with them, it's an especially credible goal because with Danone, we know that their industry or their company is entirely dependent upon access to high quality and large quantities of water. So this is not only a, uh, uh, a credible goal from a limits perspective, but it's a credible goal from the perspective of just recognizing that this is going to be a key strategic issue for them. Jeanette, did you have any thoughts or comments on this um, as, as we go through these? Um, does it resonate in terms of the internal process that you use to develop these statements? Yeah, um, I don't really have much to add, but it absolutely resonates. I think you very, you very well captured uh, a lot of what we were trying to do in all of our uh, seemingly endless internal discussions. Yeah, and that, I think that that's a great point that Jeanette makes, that it does take a lot of conversation to create these. We've been involved in supporting a few companies and creating position statements, and it certainly is not a linear activity. Um, it, you know, as you start to put it down and words matter, and then you argue over the words and you argue over the verb and you argue over the tense of the verb and, and those conversations can feel frustrating at the time, but, but we see over a period of months, 
as that conversation evolves, how it really enriches the organization's understanding of the real true impact that it's going to have on their underlying yeah, strategy. Yeah, and something that we, we, we've we noticed is that um, you can have your what you're going to put in your policy on slides and everyone can agree, but something changes when you start to write a policy and when you start to have to explain it and contextualize every decision that you're making, it really changes the conversation. So there can be an alignment internally on, on based on slides. And then when people read it, they realize, well, actually, you know, I don't know if we can, if we can really justify this because the, you know, when you have to explain something, it just changes the conversation. So always yeah. we, we try to leave time you know, a, a, a lot of time for the, the drafting and the, and the conversations afterwards because it's end up taking a lot more time than, than you would think. Yeah, and that certainly resonates with the experiences we've been involved with as well, is that this is not a situation where one person sits down and, and writes it and then, and then it gets approved. And, you know, we've seen situations where um, there's been a whole process internally with management. Everyone sort of agrees. They've come to, they've been part of this conversation. They have the kind of historic understanding of why the decisions have been made. And then when it goes to the board, the board suddenly have a whole new set of questions. And so I think it is important to think about being, having that process be incl as inclusive as you can um, uh, all the way along, because it is, these become very fundamental strategic conversations when you yeah. start to make these kinds of commitments. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely true. That tracks our experience. And so Brandon, and thanks, Jeanette. Um, so Brandon, um, what are your thoughts about um, uh, clarifying your commitments um, within your value chain? Uh, so within value chain, the two things that I look for right away are how will you be leveraging your influence within your value chain and how are you going to be trying to support those companies within your value chain? Uh, the value chain targets, I think, are most often the, the ones that I think are left for last because they are very difficult to, uh, to determine what your actual impact can be on the other members within your value chain. Uh, I think companies often have uh, hesitancy to go and put into writing how it is that they want to uh, affect the actions of others. And I think that's very easy to understand why. When I see a statement such as this one from Mars, I like how they say that they're going to be working to protect and improve water availability and eliminate unsustainable water use throughout their extended value chains. So they've clearly identified what it is that they want to help their extended value chain do. Uh, and they also say in the next sentence, you know, this 98% this of the water that we're using uh, is associated with crops and livestock within our extended value chain. They make it very clear that their big play is going to be trying to get their extended value chain to, to make those adjustments uh, and that their major lever here is to try and help that extended value chain if they want to be able to meet the commitments they've set out. Yeah, and I'll say that, um, you know, one of the things that we get really impressed by is when companies can articulate the role that they are going to play in doing that. So not just that they will exert influence and exert pressure, but what are the resources, the knowledge, the support that they are going to put in place in order to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, Diageo again on um, exerting your influence for broader positive systems change. So what I like about their statement is that uh, they draw very clear connections from their understanding of the, uh, the collective action that's required. So if we're talking about uh, driving broader systems change, uh, if you're if you're stating outright and transparently what the broader system change needs are, then it speaks well to your statement if you then go and make commitments to help literally address those calls for collective action. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they discuss their advocacy platform and on the right column there, uh, just running through the list real quick, they talk about actively supporting public policy. They talk about sharing their experience with other stakeholders. These are all factors that they've also said throughout the documents uh, are the actual actions that are necessary. So it's just simply meeting uh, what they have determined to be the necessary solution with actual commitments to those solutions. Yeah, and certainly we've seen a lot um, come out, especially in the, in, you know, in, through the experience of the, of the pandemic around companies um, taking action, but at the same time um, uh, lobbying against 
the actions that they've had in there. So I think this is another spot where we're really looking for that alignment between does your advocacy and your lobbying work align with the commitments that you've actually made in these? And are you clear about that? And, and have you, you know, have you made a commitment to making sure that that alignment is in place? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll see if, if there are questions around um, uh, clarifying your commitments. Um, and please, if there are, um, do go ahead and ask them. But um, I just want to get some quick thoughts here on being clear about sign off implementation and reporting. Yeah, I included these two examples from Mars and Tech just to show what this can look like, uh, specifically in terms of uh, uh, setting expectations for accountabilities. So I like how in Mars' statement, they, they identify the actual roles of the uh, persons who are going to be responsible for implementing their water stewardship goal, uh, senior VP and VP of uh, uh, environment. So it lets you know that there are specific positions that have already been tagged to account for this and for those results that are going to be uh, released in their annual reporting. Uh, and same thing with tech, they, they talk about how progress against their targets is going to be reported in and they provide then specific documentation titles. So you know the, the roles that are going to be involved around this, how the information is going to be reported and where. Uh, there just wasn't enough room here, but then also being able to see like an actual like sign off from the board or from the senior executives just so you know, again, that this document has received the official endorsement from the highest uh, levels of leadership in the company. Those are the sorts of things that we're looking for to, to really drive home that last bit of credibility. Uh, uh, yeah. So I guess um, I just want to really emphasize that, uh, as you can see, Brandon um, really spends and he has a, a team of, of research assistants that support him in identifying the statements and um, evaluating the statements. Um, we've tried to be as transparent as possible in how we've set these criteria. Um, as an organization, we, we are all about learning and iterating. So for those of you who are familiar with this, you'll know that we are constantly updating our, um, our database, we're constantly updating our guides, we're constantly updating our thinking on these issues. So we just really invite you to engage with us. Um, and please, if you have questions, if they seem confusing, if you wish we did things differently, if you wish there was a function available, please reach out because we're really interested in hearing those things. Um, for the kind of supporting understanding of of um, what it looks like to develop an embedded strategy and how position statements link to goals. Um, please, I, I would encourage you to take a look at our embedded strategies for the sustainability transition guide. Um, there's a few more things that, um, that can help support you. For instance, um, there are instructional videos on how to use the position statements database. There's the prior call that we had on WBCSD on the goals database. Um, this one is going to go up and they're all available on our YouTube channel, um, uh, which is new and we're excited about. Um, and then um, also, uh, if you are looking for resources to help embed sustainability across your operations on a range of topics, um, we have this um, free resource wheel where we curate for you the sort of five um, or you know, five or six or seven best resources that we are identifying that we think are, are very useful. So for instance, if you're interested in integrating into strategy, you would see a link to the, to the TCFD for the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure there, and also a link to our guide on embedded strategies and others. So, um, so hopefully that's a, a really useful um, set of tools as well for you. And then of course, there's all the tools that um, WBCSD has developed as part of the broader governance project to support you. Um, and so we often get the question uh, because we have this crazy um, model of um, producing high quality resources and giving them all away for free. Um, what could you do to support our work? And so uh, actually one of the things that really helps support us um, is if you could follow us. So um, whether that's on Twitter, um, whether it's on LinkedIn or um, whether it's subscribing to our YouTube channel, and hopefully then that means that that connects you with the latest resources that we're producing. So I'll just um, turn it over to Mario. Also ask 
If there are any final questions, comments um, from anyone, we would love to hear them. We'd be happy. We have time to answer questions, so please don't hesitate. And, and I'll just turn it back over to you, Mario. Thanks, Stephanie. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining today. Um, please, as, as Stephanie said, uh, please use these resources. Uh, a lot of time has gone into uh, building them. And so we want to make sure that they're, they're utilised and they really kind of serve your needs. So uh, please go on there and have a look and have a look at the resources on our, on our website. So uh, just like to say thank you and uh, we look forward to uh, the next session that we run. Thanks very much.